let's begin talking about my favorite subject, which is Texas. Now, what is Texas? There are so many different ways that we could define what Texas is. Texas is a state in the United States. It is almost 270,000 square miles in terms of area, making it the second largest state by area behind only Alaska. And according to the 2020 census estimate, there are almost 30 million people that live in Texas. Within Texas, there are 254 counties. But the population of Texas is very unevenly distributed in that 76% of all Texans live in just 30 counties. And you can see those counties on the right hand side of your slide on the map there. Uh, of course, the larger the uh, larger the pillar on the map, the more people live there. So you can see that uh, you have Harris County with over 4 million people. That is, of course, where Houston is. And on the other end, Loving County, Texas, has just 159 souls in the entire county. So uh, that is the most and least populous counties in Texas, Harris and Loving Counties. Furthermore, Texas is home of big cities. In fact, uh, several of the largest cities in the United States are in Texas. Houston, the largest city in Texas, is also the fourth largest in the United States. San Antonio, which is the second largest city in Texas, is seventh in the United States. Dallas, which is ninth in the nation, third in Texas. Austin, which is 14th in the country. And of course, Fort Worth, which is 15th in the country. So right there, uh, Texas has five of the top 15 most populated cities in the country. Texas is also a very diverse state. As you can see from the demographics of the state here, 41% of Texans are white, non-Hispanic, 40% are Hispanic of, of any race, 12% are African American, 5% are Asian, and just one quarter of 1% of all Texans are Native American. Uh, the remainder, of course, are one or more races that they identify as. And so Texas is a diverse state. As for myself, I am a seventh generation Texan. Uh, I was born in Austin, but my ancestors actually got to Texas in 1840. So my family on my mother's side has been in Texas since 1840. And of course, uh, so I do know a little bit about this state. And as you can tell from my accent, uh, I am indeed a Texan. Of course, Texas is large enough to really be multiple states when you think about it. And when you look at the climactic data regions of Texas, you have uh, from east to west, you have the Piney Woods of East Texas, which we'll talk about, and you have the upper Gulf Coast where Houston is located, Port Arthur, all the way down. You have South Central Texas, and you have, of course, Austin and San Antonio in that region. South Texas, south of San Antonio, the lower Rio Grande Valley at the very southern tip of the state. West of Austin, you have the Edwards Plateau, and that is, of course, where you have the Texas Hill Country. North of the Edwards Plateau, you have the Rolling Plains, and then west of the Rolling Plains, you have the High Plains, or the Llano Estacado. We'll talk about them more in a moment as well. And then you have the area west of the Pecos River, which is called the Trans-Pecos Region, which includes the Big Bend in the Rio Grande, Big Bend National Park, as well as the Davis Mountains and El Paso, among many other attractions. Here you can see the major rivers of Texas, which are very influential in shaping how the state developed. On the very eastern boundary of Texas, you have the Sabine River. My grandmother from East Texas always called it the Sabine, equal emphasis on both syllables. So Sabine it is. 
Often you'll find that Texas place names are best pronounced by those that are from those places. And they don't like uh, it when outsiders mispronounce their rivers or towns or counties. West of the Sabine, you have the Neches River and then the Trinity River, which, of course, the two forks of the Trinity River run through Dallas and Fort Worth toward the northern end of that river. Then you have the San Jacinto River, uh, the Brazos River, which actually comes from Spanish, Los Brazos de Dios, the arms of God. So that's where you get Brazos or arms. And then you have the Guadalupe and Lavaca Rivers, the San Antonio River, of course, which runs through San Antonio, the Nueces River, which dumps into the Gulf of Mexico at Corpus Christi, the Colorado River, just west of the Brazos. You have the Pecos River, which actually begins up in New Mexico, and the Canadian River, which runs through the Panhandle, although it is nowhere near Canada. Meanwhile, the, you have the Rio Grande, probably the most famous Texas River of all, and the Red River that separates Texas from Oklahoma. Uh, the Rio Grande actually begins in Colorado and flows down through Colorado, New Mexico, before reaching El Paso, and then ultimately down to the Gulf Coast. Although Texas is one state, the people and the regions of Texas differ dramatically from each other, often. At the very eastern edge of Texas, you have the Piney Woods, and you can see there the Piney Woods on the map and an image of the Pine Woods. The Piney Woods are an extension of the Deep South. They are the Texas South, and there really is no difference between the Piney Woods of East Texas and most parts of Alabama, Mississippi, or rural Georgia, for that matter. So you have the Piney Woods on the east, or as some Texans call it, the Pine Curtain. Just west of the Piney Woods, you have what's called the Post Oak Savanna. You can see it there on the map. Uh, and of course, post oak trees uh, predominate in this region. Uh, and of course, post oak trees that separate plains, uh, the plains from the Piney Woods. The area west of the Post Oak Savanna is called the Blackland Prairie because it the soil is so rich, it's literally black. Uh, of course, the Blackland Prairie includes Dallas and parts of eastern Tarrant County as well. It goes all the way down the into the Brazos River Valley, the Blackland Prairie, and that's pretty much what it looks like on the right, uh, just flat grasslands. West of the Blackland Prairie, you have the Cross Timbers region and prairie. And the Cross Timbers is really the northern extension of the Texas Hill Country. Of course, this is what a lot of Fort Worth and western Tarrant County and areas west of Fort Worth look like. And so that is the, called the Cross Timbers. West of the Cross Timbers, you have the Rolling Plains. And the Rolling Plains include places like Wichita Falls, all the way up to Amarillo. Amarillo sits on the very edge of the Rolling Plains as opposed to the High Plains. And the Rolling Plains are really the southernmost extension of the Great Plains that run all the way through the United States. In the far western part of the Texas Panhandle, you have a massive geologic uplift that when the Spanish first spotted it, and we'll talk about the first Spanish, uh, the first Spanish expedition to cross it. They called it the Llano Estacado, or Stockaded Plain, because from a distance it looks like a stockade rising out of the ground. And then when you get up on top of it, you'll find it is as flat as a tabletop. Uh, up on top of the Llano Estacado is the flattest land I've ever encountered in my life. Uh, the image on the right here is of Palo Duro Canyon which uh, cuts uh, is a canyon that cuts through the Llano Estacado. But up on top of the High Plains or the Llano Estacado is actually where most Texas cotton production occurs today and includes places like Lubbock. West of Austin, you have the Edwards Plateau, 
which is another massive geologic uplift, but this time the Edwards Plateau actually forms the Texas Hill Country. And the Texas Hill Country, of course, especially when the blue bonnets are in bloom in early spring, is probably the prettiest part of Texas. Uh, Fredericksburg, uh, northwest, the area northwest of San Antonio, and west of Austin. So the Edwards Plateau. And on the Edwards Plateau, you will find the Texas Hill Country. West of the Pecos River, you find the Trans-Pecos region. And this region actually contains the only desert in Texas, the Chihuahua Desert. Uh, Hollywood portrayals often portray most of Texas as a desert. Many of these movies, if they are actually filmed in Texas, are actually filmed in the Trans-Pecos region. Uh, at the southern end of the Trans-Pecos region, you have the Big Bend in the Rio Grande, and you have Big Bend National Park. Now, this is an area of Texas where you have counties that are larger than entire states elsewhere. Uh, of course, at the western end of the Trans-Pecos area, you have El Paso. It was a, 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 cross in the, a crossing in the mountains that was known as El Paso del Norte to the Spanish, and Americans have shortened it to El Paso. The very southern tip of Texas is called the Rio Grande Valley a valley caused by the confluence of the Rio Grande River with the Gulf of Mexico. And here you will find uh, thriving metropolises like Brownsville and McAllen and all of the border towns you can see on the right. This is a, a, a view of the Rio Grande River. It is a wide river, but relatively shallow. And of course, serves as the boundary between Texas and Mexico today. One of the main themes of this course is going to be Texas politics through the ages, but where do Texas politics stand today? This map here uh, shows you the breakdown of the vote by county in the 2018 Senate race, the last big election that we had in Texas. Of course, Texas will vote for President of the United States as well as a U.S. Senator this fall as well. Uh, but in that 2018 Senate race, you can see the blue counties are the counties that voted Democrat uh, for the Democratic candidate in 2018, Beto O'Rourke of El Paso. And the red counties are the counties that voted for the Republican candidate, Ted Cruz. You'll see that Cruz carried Texas with 51% of the vote. O'Rourke got 48% of the vote. And although Texas is a Republican state and has been for most of the last 40 years, you'll see that Texas is also very evenly divided when it comes to politics. Uh, the large cities like Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, El Paso tend to vote Democrat along with the Rio Grande Valley and the rural areas of Texas in the Panhandle in the uh, in the uh, um, the hill country and in the piney woods of East Texas tend to vote heavily Republican. So uh, Texas, though, is becoming more and more of a purple state, neither Republican nor Democrat, but a swing state. Now let's talk about Texas history. History is a some, sometimes complicated thing. Uh, that people often use for their own purposes. And a lot of the earliest history of Texas was written by George Garrison. And George Garrison was a professor at the University of Texas uh, in Austin from 1888 until his death in 1910. A lot of Garrison's writings, though, are filled with racism, as was typical of a man born before the Civil War. But Texas history is far more complex than we've often been led to believe. There are two distinct uh, threads of thought within Texas history, or, or disciplines, if you will. Most of what passes for Texas history today, when we think of the Alamo or the Battle of San Jacinto or Confederate monuments or any of the rest of Texas, is actually collective memory. Now, collective memory is, collective memory 
or historical memory, as it's sometimes called, um, is the mem the shared pool of memories, knowledge, and information of a social group that is significantly associated with the group's identity. And so when you're building nationalism or a sense of a country or a sense of a state, in the case of Texas, you want this sort of collective memory. But collective memory is not history. History is systematic study of the past. And the goal of history is to arrive at a comprehensive, accurate, and unbiased portrayal of past events. Uh, that includes uh, comparing multiple perspectives and the integration of these perspectives and details to provide a complete and much more nuanced picture. In contrast, collective memory focuses on a single perspective, uh, the perspective of one social group, nation, or community. Historically, Texas history has focused on the history of Anglos in Texas, English-speaking uh, people descended of Europeans. And yet, that is not all of Texas history. As you probably know, uh, just from looking around you, if you're ever in Texas, uh, on the right, you can see Lorenzo de Zavala, the first vice president of the Republic of Texas and a Mexican national. And on the left, you can see a picture of African-American cowboys. Keep in mind that we often think of cowboys in the Old West as being white, like in the John Wayne movie. But in fact, about 25% of cowboys were either African-American or Mexican-American. One of the most fascinating things about Texas is how this sense of Texas nationalism has developed. Texas exceptionalism, or as I've heard other Texas historians refer to it, Texceptionalism. The idea that Texas is better. Why? Well, because Texas is better. Again, this is an example of that collective memory uh, that I was speaking about earlier. And Texas nationalism developed early on, and it's had a lasting impact on the way that Texans view ourselves, on the way that Texans view the world. Uh, you can see on the left an image of Texas. If you recall, there used to be a slogan the Texas Travel, uh, uh, Texas Travel Agency used to uh, advertise Texas. It's like a whole other country. On the right, you see the San Jacinto Monument at the San Jacinto Battlefield, constructed in the 1930s. The congressman from Texas who got the funding for the monument was specifically instructed not to make it taller than the Washington Monument, and he didn't until he added the giant star on the top of the monument that made it taller than the Washington Monument. Uh, things like the San Jacinto Monument, uh, which there's a great museum in there in the bottom of the monument, are is but this is an example of texas nationalism and texas collective memory and collective memory while it is fun and sometimes informative is not history one of the images that always comes to my mind when discussing texas collective memory and texas nationalism is the giant statue of sam houston situated along interstate 45 near huntsville uh, and as you are driving along Interstate 45, all of a sudden you come across this great giant white marble statue of Sam Houston. And the building of these kind of oversized statues to men that Texans believe have been heroes in the past is another manifestation of this sort of Texas nationalism. And again, while it is fun uh, and somewhat whimsical, and maybe a tad scary if you're driving at night and all of a sudden happen upon a giant gleaming white statue of Sam Houston out of nowhere. It is not uh, Texas history. It is part of Texas history, but it's not all of Texas history. Another part of Texas history that we often have to deal with are myths surrounding Texas. Not just the history of Texas, but of Texas itself. And these four images, to me, sum up many of the myths about Texas. You have a painting that hangs in the capital of Davy Crockett swinging his musket at the Alamo as he goes down. Uh, 
uh, before being killed by Mexican soldiers. Whether or not this scene actually ever happened probably doesn't matter much to most Texans. They simply like the imagery. Uh, but outside of Texas, uh, Hollywood often conceptualizes Texas as a, as a desert, uh, like we see in the image there, or as a land of cowboys, or as a land of oil wells. And although all of these things are a part of Texas, they certainly are not all of Texas. And so back to the original question that I began this lecture with, what is Texas? We know it's a big area, we know it's a beautiful area, we know it's a very diverse area in terms of people and landscapes. We know that there is a lot of history to it and we know that there is a lot of collective memory to it. And so I hope that you will see fit to come along in this journey with me as we learn more about Texas. From the first Texans, the indigenous peoples who lived here before European contact, all the way to the present. And so whether it's images of Texas like the Dallas Cowboys playing in a stadium with a retractable roof so that God can watch his team play. Yes, that's an actual thing people said. Or it's Cowboys, uh, whether the reality or the myth of them, uh, real Cowboys that is. Uh, I hope you'll come along in this journey of Texas history with me. And I look forward to taking it together with all of you.